Some have pointed with justifiable pride and called him the new breed of fighting man. But if breeding is to be consistent, if it's to mean anything, then this is the same man that went ashore at Iwo Jima, Guadalcanal, Inchon, and only yesterday at the Batangan Peninsula in South Vietnam. History has dictated few changes in the life of the United States Marine. His primary mission is still the winning of the... The battle is the culmination of months and years of preparation. Suddenly, all of those seemingly small, isolated moments of rigorous training are funneled into a few days, a few hours, when mobility, firepower, and leadership must take on a definitive pattern within the framework of a calculated risk. A pattern that not only acknowledges the strengths and weaknesses of the enemy, but also the time and the place where he can be defeated. The time, 0630, September the 7th, 1965. Mission, Operation Piranha. A four-day search and destroy action by combined United States and Vietnamese military forces against a suspected stronghold of 2,000 Viet Cong guerrillas on the twin peninsulas of Batangan and An Ki, 20 miles south of Chu Lai. For the men of the 1st Battalion, 7th Regiment, this was the sort of operation for which all Marines are qualified. Born of time, necessity, and circumstance, and nurtured to near perfection under fire during the Pacific Campaign of World War II, the amphibious assault has become the trademark of the Navy Marine Corps team, a symbol of their role in America's combat readiness. But even before the 1st Battalion had begun to assemble at its debarking stations at sea, the men of the 3rd Battalion, 7th, were forming up into copter apportioned sticks for loading at a hastily constructed helipad near the outskirts of Chu Lai. vertical envelopment doctrine in operation. Utilizing three centrally controlled helicopter squadrons, the men of the 3rd Battalion were airlifted to Landing Zone Oak, a strip of elevated ground running across the twin throats of Batangan and An Ki. From here, they would act as a blocking force to the retreating Viet Cong as the 1st Battalion began its push from the beach. landing of the first wave of Marines, 16 of the choppers broke away from landing zone Oak and sped 10 miles south to the Republic of Vietnam stronghold at Quang Gai. There they began the hella lift of two Vietnamese battalions to landing zones Pine and Birch, located on the far side of the Song Chow Mai Dong River. By 0945, the vertical envelopment was completed and the stranglehold across the windpipes of Batangan and An Ki stretched for a full eight miles. By late morning, advanced marine patrols had already moved in from the beach to their first objectives, and others formed up, ready to follow. On the outskirts of villages like Chao Mei Wan, civilians were quickly gathered together for safe transportation behind the marine lines. And as they moved off, 
the Marines stopped small groups and asked the same question over and over again. Where are the Viet Cong? The answer that came back was always the same. They're gone. They left before you came. The expected Viet Cong resistance at the beaches had never materialized. And now, even further inland, only scattered sniper fire broke the calm. This was the penalty that the Marines had to pay for their own efficiency, the very strength of United States firepower that had won so many victories in the past had driven the Viet Cong to cover or full retreat. The possibility of any single big contact was going to be harder and harder to come by. As night fell on their first day ashore, the Marines dug in and waited. Finally, the word came back. Only four Viet Cong killed, six captured, 48 suspects being held. It was evident that an old familiar pattern of battle was taking shape. The Marines had seen it before at places like Iwo Jima, Saipan, and Guadalcanal. Three of the four Viet Cong killed on the previous day had been flushed from a cave. This could mean only one thing. The Viet Cong were there all right, but they'd have to be dug and blasted out. to the search and destroy operation was the jet hot pad at Chulai. Standing on strip alert, Marine attack jets were only minutes away from a platoon leader's radioed call for an airstrike with almost any lethal combination of weapons he might want or need, from 20 millimeter aircraft cannon and high velocity rockets or bombs to bullpup missiles. First time in Marine Corps history, control of the air support elements was handled by Marines circling above the battlefield at 18,000 feet. In the past, the DASC, or Direct Air Support Center, during such operations, has been located on a communication ship lying offshore. This time, a KC Hercules was outfitted to do the job. Its crews monitored requests from ground forces and assigned aircraft to requested strike areas. But if the innovations of the jet airstrike and DASC were important to the success of the Piranha campaign, the backbone of the attack was still the man on the ground, the man with the singular philosophy embodied in the words leadership and discipline. Combat is a test of courage and endurance, a forced inbreeding that teaches the individual to respond to a command under any conditions. It's a disciplined struggle for life, hinging upon the absolute control of those who command and the unswerving loyalty of those who follow. had confirmed 70 Viet Cong killed, four captured.
By the end of the third day, the Viet Cong resistance was broken. One by one, the caves were opened up and the enemy rotted out. When the smoke had cleared over one hole, the Marines discovered, to their amazement, a limestone cavern over six feet high and 250 feet long. It yielded up the bodies of 66 dead Viet Cong. Up to that time, it was the largest single kill made by the Marines since their arrival in Vietnam. By September the 10th, it was all over. Batangan and An Ki were secure. Four day total, 198 Viet Cong killed, 38 enemy captured, 265 VC suspects detained. The cost, one Marine dead, eight wounded. While several elements of the Marine assault team were being withdrawn to another battle area west of Da Nang, others remained behind. For while the Marines had completed their primary mission, had won the battle, there was still a further American responsibility. The villagers needed food, medical supplies, and continuing protection. They needed assurance that they were realizing the beginnings of justice, for without justice, Security and self-dependency would never arrive. All Americans in Vietnam, both military and civilian, know there's more than a fighting mission for them in their support of the embattled Republic of Vietnam. They have heard and understand the words of President Johnson, who said, a nation cannot be built by armed power or by political agreement. It will rest on the expectation by individual men and women that their future will be better than their past when the final battle is won in Vietnam. This is the Vietnam of the Mekong Delta, one of the 9th Infantry Division's defense areas. It is the Vietnam of endless rice paddies and swamps, of myriad waterways, the Mitho River, the Vam Co, the Can Juic, the Na Bae. A watery battleground for which the 9th Division soldier is very well equipped. He is the striking arm of the Mobile Riverine Force, a unique joint operation by the United States Army and Navy, as novel and precedent-setting as the Air Cavalry. To provide the payoff, as in all forms of war, both new and old, come the infantrymen. These are soldiers of the 9th Infantry Division. Their stout-hearted performance in battle has added luster to the nickname the Division I in World War II the old reliables. Okay, move out. The 9th had a glorious history in World War II. It served in Africa, France, and Germany, and quickly won the reputation of being unbeatable, completely reliable in action. I know because I started out with them in North Africa. The terrain and the enemy have changed. 
Vietnam is far different from Europe. But one thing hasn't changed, the fighting spirit of the 9th Division. The men who wear its patch today have proved themselves to be from the same stock as the old reliables. I know them and their battle record well. I was assigned to the division's information office when it was reactivated for combat under the urgency of the Vietnam War. That was in February 1966 at Fort Riley, Kansas. In record time, the new 9th Division was transformed from a cadre of officers, non-coms, and a mass of recruits into a combat-ready division. We said our goodbyes. By November of 1966, the 9th Division's 3rd Brigade was en route to Vietnam. In December, the 1st and 2nd Brigades followed. It was a long voyage, halfway around the world. Plenty of time for detailed training and calisthenics. But still time to relax. In Vietnam, meanwhile, our base was being rushed to completion, expanded from a smaller camp left by the 1st Infantry Division. This camp, called Bearcat, was established as the division base. It occupied a strategic position in relation to Saigon, with firm lines of communication to the sea at Vung Tau, port of entry and naval base. The 1st and 2nd Brigades came ashore at Vung Tau in January and February 1967. They were under the command of Major General G.S. Eckhart. By late January, the 1st Brigade had already been in combat in Operation Colby against a Viet Cong stronghold southeast of Saigon. and clear operation was finished, we went on to another, and another. The 9th Division's main responsibility, however, was to help secure the Mekong Delta. This vast, fertile area is virtually one gigantic rice paddy, broken up by rivers, canals, and earthen dikes. The Republic of Vietnam armed forces have been fighting a long struggle against the Viet Cong in the Delta. Our job was to help them. It was decided to set up operations at Dong Tam, about 40 miles from Saigon on the Mitho River. The question was, where do you put troops when every square inch of dry ground is lived on by Vietnamese or used to grow food? The answer was, create your own dry land. The world's largest dredges brought up millions of tons of sand from the riverbed and made a base capable of supporting an entire division. Supplies would come in via land, sea, and air. Thanks to the engineers, the Dong Tam base soon had its own airstrip, big enough to handle caribou-sized fixed-wing aircraft, as well as helicopters. A large force moved in right away. Not that we stayed on base very much. Most of the time, we were out in the rice paddies, scouting for the enemy, and learning how to operate in the deceptive terrain. 
what looks like a scenic rice paddy to the eye often feels like a swamp to the feet. You're lucky to keep moving, however slowly, in this watery muck. When it becomes more muddy than watery, a man can be completely immobilized. Getting stuck in a mud hole can be an exasperating experience. The swampy mud makes one grateful to hit open water. This stream was supposed to be fordable. In a way, it was, from the neck up. When the water gets too deep for treading, the men of the 9th Division turn on a little Yankee ingenuity, using an air mattress to float gear across a stream. Or by making a raft out of a poncho. For a 9th Division scout dog, a river crossing is no problem at all. The watery terrain makes it hazardous, even for the highly mobile helicopter to use a rice paddy for a helipad. A fairly hard earthen dike is much safer when it's available. Operation of ground vehicles proved to be a chancy thing, too. The powerful armored personnel carriers often plow through swamp water with great ease, but muddy roads are a real hazard. When you gamble on moving tracked vehicles on terrain like this, you can be a loser as often as not. The Delta proved to be a testing ground for machines as well as men, but as we got to know the lay of the land, we learned how to keep the armored personnel carriers moving. These APCs are M113s. We like to have their firepower around when we hit a Viet Cong ambush. We often ran into them without warning. harmless looking piece of scenery might explode with enemy fire or a boot track. And there was always the difficulty of determining who was friendly and who wasn't. The Rock Kien area was full of tunnels and underground hiding places. Some were even underwater. We always left a grenade as a call card. share of purple hearts from sniper fire and booby traps. But we called in medevac to get our casualties out fast. Stopping didn't necessarily mean resting. We filled sandbags for our defensive perimeters. In one month, the 9th Division filled half a million sandbags. Half a million! We got a surprise visit from a 9th Division veteran, General William C. Westmoreland. He dropped in during Operation Fort C, in which we bagged a lot of Viet Cong supplies and equipment. We were all pleased to see him wearing a 9th Division patch from his service with the old 9th in Tunisia. We kept moving, or rather sloshing ahead. Wetness was the order of the day the week, and the month. Most of us would feel strange if we ever got dry. Well, it did simplify taking a bath. And washing laundry. Gradually, we began to move more and more on the waterways, not in them. They became highways, not obstacles. Of course, the division's helicopters continued to play a major role as air taxis for troops. To transport artillery, vehicles, even other helicopters. And to extend the medical civil assistance program, MedCap, 
deep into isolated Delta villages whose inhabitants seldom see a doctor. The medic showed that sometimes the best medicine comes in the form of a laugh. The fixed-wing spotter planes, nicknamed bird dogs, had the job of guiding aircraft into strikes at enemy positions. While the jets orbit overhead, the bird dogs take a run at the VC positions to mark them with smoke rockets. The pilots are highly trained Air Force Forward Air Controllers, FACs. They don't hesitate to fly low within a few hundred feet of the enemy in order to bring the planes in on target. The daring and precision of these men is a major reason for the tremendous effectiveness of inter-service cooperation between the Army and the Air Force. The war in the Delta produced another form of inter-service cooperation in which the 9th Division played a major role. The Army and Navy combined resources to create a unique strike force to which the Air Force also gave fire support. It was called the Mobile Riverine Force. The 2nd Brigade of the 9th Division was its primary combat unit. One must go back to the American Civil War to find a major precedent for this Inland Waterways Task Force. Army and Navy working together as a fighting team. When the men go out on a mission, they have the close support of the Navy flotilla with all the facilities necessary to resupply and maintain them. The soldiers live aboard the USS Benoa and the USS Colleton when not fighting. These floating barracks hold a 30-day supply of fresh food and provide medical, dental, and other facilities. The auxiliary personnel lighter also accommodates men of the Mobile Riverine Force. The USS Ascari contains a complete machine shop and facilities needed to maintain and repair weapons and equipment. Seaborne supplies are usually brought up from Vung Tau or Dong Tam by LST. In case of need, choppers bring in supplies directly to the decks of ships. The workhorses of the Mobile Riverine Force are the armored troop carriers, or ATCs. The ATC is armor-plated and has an armored canopy over the troop area. It can carry a two and a half ton truck or a 105 millimeter howitzer. The command and communications boat, or CCB, is the control center for the ground forces commander and the boat group commander. The battleship of the flotilla is the monitor, a landing craft armed with a 40 millimeter and a 20 millimeter cannon, an 81 millimeter mortar, plus 50 and 30 caliber machine guns. This variety of weapons makes this shallow draft vessel a versatile fire support ship. It was in firepower that the 9th made its own important innovation, the use of barges as artillery platforms. Infantry elements of the Mobile Riverine Force would range far and wide once operations started. The guns and mortars aboard the armored troop carriers and monitors did not have either the range or the caliber to provide the long-range heavy fire support troops would need. Only artillery could do this. The 9th Division's 3rd Battalion, 34th Artillery, decided to try using barges as gun platforms, anchoring them firmly to shore. The M102, 105 millimeter howitzer, the lightweight, flexible model originally designed for airborne operations, proved to be an excellent weapon for this purpose. The M102 carriages provided an easy 360-degree traverse. Steel braces were welded to the deck to keep the gun in place. 
Two 105s to a barge, three barges to a battery. Necessity, rising out of conditions in the Mekong Delta, had caused the 9th Division to come up with a new way of deploying artillery to back up its waterborne troops. Another invention was the airmobile firing platform. This device made it possible to have heavy fire support follow troops as they moved inland in the delta. Because it is 90% aluminum, the 24-foot square can easily be airlifted to rice paddies or to streams or canals remote from the main riverways. It provides a stable firing platform in muddy riverbanks up to four feet deep. Mechanical jacks at each corner can be adjusted to keep the platform level. Packed with troops and firepower, the Mobile Riverine Force was ready to go anywhere in the watery wilderness. An ATC can carry a full platoon of combat-equipped soldiers and move in just about any river, canal, or creek. This mobility in shallow as well as deep water has enormously increased the striking range of infantrymen in the Delta. The men get set to hit the beach. Before they go in, however, Air Force jets pound the landing area. The fighter bombers saturate the Viet Cong position. As the ATCs move into the beach, the men add their own fires to keep the enemy down. Before long, the men of the 9th Division made contact with the enemy only to find them strongly dug in. So the heavy stuff, 155 millimeter howitzers, are brought in to knock out the VC positions. When the enemy tried to break off the battle, airborne reinforcements were called in to cut him off at the canal. All casualties were quickly evacuated and given emergency treatment on the hospital-equipped ships of the Mobile Riverine Force. The division commander tried to bring us in from the field every three days. We were greeted with a fire hose salute to get the swamp mud off before we went below for hot showers hot chow, dry clothes, and a comfortable bunk. It wasn't hard for the 9th Division landlubbers to take sea duty under these conditions. There was even time to go on deck and look at the scenery ashore, a native village, or a colorful assortment of native river craft that for a little while made us feel like tourists on a cruise. Soon enough, another passerby on the river brought us back to the fact that the war was very much with us. The 9th Division had a training mission as well as a fighting one. We were proud of our reliable academy that taught the fine points of fighting in Vietnam to newcomers. As well as sharpening the skills of combat veterans. The importance of the academy was emphasized by frequent visits by the new commanding general of the 9th Division, Major General George O'Connor, who assumed command in June 1967. The men of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam were also given intensive instruction by the division in all types of weapons and equipment. It wasn't long before training of this nature paid off. 
South Vietnamese troops became more effective and acquitted themselves well in battles with the Viet Cong. Other academy students were these crack troops from Thailand. These tough little men are known as the Queen's Cobra Regiment. We oriented them on the use of the compass in land navigation and other equipment, emphasizing devices useful in jungle fighting. Their officers were given demonstrations in the tactics of counter-guerrilla warfare. We also ran the ties through a quick reaction course to teach them to stay cool and fire back when they ran into a Viet Cong ambush. A very special school trains the 9th Division's long-range reconnaissance patrols. The beret and special patch its members wear testify to their elite status. The men are trained hard to develop stamina, strength and alertness for their secret missions of reconnaissance, ambush or sabotage. They must be able to endure a maximum of stress on a minimum of sleep, food and water. They cannot expect help if trapped by the enemy. Their lives depend on their own resourcefulness and endurance. They become experts at camouflage. Success of the mission depends on perfect concealment. They must blend into the jungle even better than the Viet Cong. They are briefed in detail on terrain features and the location of the enemy objective. Every man knows how to navigate by day and by night. The patrol is inserted into enemy territory by a helicopter that flies in at low level. The men dismount in five seconds or less and move out swiftly. Ideally, they hope to avoid detection by or contact with the enemy. Mission accomplished, the team leader calls out an azimuth and the distance to the extraction point, then leads the patrol back. Normally, a mission will last several days or longer. The men are completely out of communication with their base until they rendezvous with the helicopter at a predetermined time and place. Despite the high hazard in these missions, there is no lack of volunteers. Far less exciting is the regular daily routine of combat, going out on patrol, coming back from patrol, monotonous mostly. Still, the year passed quickly. So quickly, we were almost taken by surprise when we got reminders in the mail that Christmas was here. The item that really made this Yuletide a memorable one was this streamlined version of Santa Claus. She was minus only reindeer, but a very welcome visitor. The beginning of the new year was memorable too, since the enemy started their offensive then. They tried every trick in the book, but here in 9th Division country, the Viet Cong never had a chance. They were clobbered by our superior firepower. through fighting. Large amounts of captured weapons. And we rescued one friendly. We kept pushing ahead in the rice paddies. And the jungle. Fighting from the rivers. And from the air, we drove on. 
and will continue to drive on until a just and honorable peace is won. So that these people may have a chance to live their lives in the way they choose, without fear or communist coercion. That is what this war is all about. To achieve this, the 9th Division will stay on the job as long as it has to. Many new pages will be added to the division history. Many battle streamers were won in South Vietnam, and there may be several more before the 9th goes home. While it remains in Vietnam, it will do what it has always done, fight and win. And that, in a phrase, is the story of the 9th Division. That is why its pride of outfit is so strong. That is why it cherishes its reputation as the old reliables. is an American fighter bomber attacking a communist installation in Vietnam. Its firepower is accurate and deadly. Successful air thrust into areas that have been under the Viet Cong control is lifting the spirits of the Allies. American air arm hits hard and continuously, and it hits the Kong where it hurts the most, right in his own front yard. This fighter jet was designed for air support, capable of delivering bombs rockets, and guided missiles. It takes a professional pilot with courage and skill to get this high-speed jet in low enough and close enough to make each shot count. have made direct hits and inflicted severe damage and destruction upon the enemy. Home for these Skyhawks could be the flight deck of a powerful Navy carrier at sea, or Da Nang with its permanent runways, or it could be this unfinished marine airstrip at Chulai flying field carved in 26 days out of an obscure beach in South Vietnam. In length, it's the size of three flat tops laid end to end. Even unfinished, it's fully operational. This field was built primarily for marine support aircraft. Each piece is portable. The control tower can be picked up and moved by a helicopter. The arresting gear was hauled from the beach by a tractor trailer. The runway comes in a truck, in sections. It can support the heaviest transport plane. An instant airfield built to accommodate more traffic than most stateside airports. But a month ago, there was no Chulai. Just sand, heat, more sand. And Marine determination to build an airfield. It all started here on this unnamed beach on the China Sea. For these Marines, it's just another landing, 10,000 miles from home. To them, this was nothing new. 
nothing different. They've been doing it opposed and unopposed for almost 200 years. This mission, seize and defend enough real estate to build an airfield. It sounds simple. It is for professionals. The helicopter hasn't changed the idea behind the amphibious assault. It's just added a new dimension. Marines arrive in helicopters from Navy carriers at sea, sealing the approaches to the beachhead. The object? Find the Viet Cong, engage him, destroy him, or drive him off. But at Chu Lai, he couldn't be found. The guerrilla chose not to fight. Seabees move in right behind the Marines. They find their enemy, sand. Sand so deep, even powerful earth movers bog down. Under the sand, the ground is flat. But the CBs want it flatter. For the matting, it comes in sections. Interlocking aluminum planks that weigh 144 pounds and can stand the impact of a fully loaded giant cargo plane. This is hot, hard work. The sand is always there. The CBs curse it, fight it, but still, it has to be moved. The entire area around the airfield has to be searched and patrolled. The Marines give themselves little rest. The Viet Cong can be allowed no sanctuary. For two years, this was his sanctuary. The Marines have to find him, root him out. The villagers help. They fear the Viet Cong reprisals, but they do help by pointing out the Cong hiding places. The Marines find traces of the enemy, medical stores, communist propaganda, caches of food, and the gorilla himself, a tough, trained enemy. Innocent looking, but deadly. Marines patrol deep into the brush searching for gorillas. It's a hot, dirty, frustrating job. Frequent breaks are necessary. Water is a precious item. You can drink it, or cool off with it. Each man carries his pantry on his back. And sometimes his meal is interrupted. The Marines pursue the enemy. He's elusive. This is his territory, and he knows it well. Well enough to hit, run, and then vanish. While the Marines hunt the Viet Cong, the airfield is growing. The Marines even give it a name. They call it Chu Lai. Sand hills vanish and depressions are filled. Each interlocking panel is designed to fit perfectly into place. Almost. Hour by hour, the strip takes shape. It is now almost 3,500 feet long. In the days to follow, 
the sea bees will more than double its length. But a combat airfield needs more than a runway. It needs a mirror landing system and a resting gear, like that used on aircraft carriers. It needs refueling points, revetments to protect airplanes, a tank farm for fuel, complete to the last detail. Everything necessary is now in place. Ready, waiting. The control tower is in radio contact with the incoming flight and has cleared it to land. Chu Lai's newest arrival, a fast, sleek Skyhawk, comes screaming in for a landing. These jets are only the first combat marine attack squadrons to be based at this field. Four hours from now, these same jets will be launched for their first strike mission in support of ground forces. The airfield at Chu Lai is now alive. The Skyhawks have a home. It is now the ground crew's turn to take over. Their job is to refuel, arm, and get these marine jets into the air war as soon as possible. July is operating like a well-oiled machine. It hardly seems possible that this busy, portable combat airbase was landed, uncrated, and operating in just a matter of weeks. And if necessary, it could be moved again to any trouble spot in the world. This combat airfield is hungry. Its enormous appetite consumes tons of supplies each day. Necessary supplies to sustain thousands of men and their machines. Many items must be delivered daily to keep Chu Lai operational. Fuel for jets. High velocity air to ground rockets. 20 millimeter shells for aircraft cannon. And food, usually sea rations. Water and lots of it. And most important of all, fresh replacements. For the first time in weeks, there is an opportunity to relax. A chance to really wash off the sand and dirt. And letters to write home as often as possible. Young Americans look forward to receiving a package. A package of anything. They convert their pay to money orders and send it home for another time, another place. Young Marines soon learn the value of seemingly trivial things. Clean socks, a haircut, clean teeth, and a shave. Around the perimeter, the patrols into the hills or deep into the hot jungles continue. Some dig in and wait, watchful, ready. At July, they must endure the tropic heat and the discomfort of foxholes scratched in the sand. They call themselves pick and shovel architects, and the term fits. These men are all willing to face hardships and danger anywhere their country or corps sends them. As Americans, 
they are defending their right to live and believe as they choose. And they're pledged to defend the same right for others. Pledged to make good an American promise to the people of South Vietnam. A part of this promise stands here on the sands of Chu Lai, the result of American determination to build an airfield, sand and steel. <laughs> 